Kidney disease amongst kids is rare, but can be truly devastating to a family. We didn't know until he was born that he was born in stage four renal failure. I mean, it changed our lives forever. That's a mom who donated one of her kidneys to her child who was born with kidney disease, Katie Aducci. In this episode of the Journey Continues podcast, she'll share her journey with kidney disease along with pediatric social worker, Nicole Dumont. I'm Monica Fox, kidney transplant recipient and director of outreach and government relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. Thank you both for joining me today. Katie, tell me about your journey with kidney disease. My journey with kidney disease centers around um, my son, Max. He's 11 years old. When I had my 20 week ultrasound, Um, When I was pregnant with him, uh, we knew something was going to be wrong with his kidneys based on that ultrasound. We didn't know until he was born that he was born in stage four renal failure. When he was 10 months old, we started peritoneal dialysis with him. And then um, at 18 months, he was able to get a living um, donor transplant. I was able to be his kidney donor. So your son has his very own hero, his mom. Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Nicole, tell me what role do you play in the kidney uh, community? About three years ago, I started working as the social worker for the kidney disease and kidney transplant program at Lurie Children's Hospital. And uh, prior to that, I really didn't have any specific involvement in kidney diseases or kidney transplant. And so I can say that my my love, appreciation, understanding for working with families and children with kidney disease really started at that moment. I, as the social worker for the kidney disease and kidney transplant program at Lurie, I learned so much about not only kidney disease, but also about how it impacts families and children that um, have been diagnosed with kidney disease. And it just became such a big part of my life, not only my career, but something that I really enjoyed doing. And so my current role is actually still through Lurie Children's Hospital as an individual and family therapist. So I now work in our psychiatry and psychology program, but I continue to try to stay involved with families that we supported and served by staying involved with the National Kidney Foundation. So happy to hear that families dealing with kidney disease have someone like you to be of support. And I can't wait to learn more about that. Katie, how did your son's journey impact your family? I have a um, daughter that's three years older than him. So, I mean, it changed our lives forever. Having a second kid would have changed our lives, but having a second kid that has needed all the extra medical care and time in the hospital and special equipment and special doctor's appointments all the time has, has changed our lives. But all the bad has come with a lot of good too. We've learned a lot. People have been so kind to us along the way. So any little darkness that we've ever had has definitely been washed out by the light that people have shown us along the way. Sounds like you are making the best of it. What impact did it have on you personally? I've been really lucky. I've been a nurse for 16 years. So well before I had my children. So I've been really lucky that I could understand what was going on, which I think is really hard for parents to wrap their heads around. It's kind of an invisible disease. Sometimes it's not like your child has cancer and they have chemotherapy, they are bald. And then, you know, like it's really hard to wrap your mind around kidney disease sometimes. Um, So I was grateful that I had that understanding. But For me, as someone who takes care of people at the bedside, it has made me much more sensitive to what is going on in their minds, for sure. And it's definitely made me probably better at everything that I do. And in the experience of being able to be a living donor, um, it's really hard to just, you know, put words into what a miracle that is. So, yeah. It is truly a miracle. And like I stated earlier, 
you are your son's very own hero and he is really lucky. I have to wonder also, did you have any difficulties with your career during this um, I, time? I have been so lucky. So I've been working at the same hospital in the emergency department, which is kind of you know, a difficult place to be now that I'm dealing with someone who's immunocompromised, you know, all the anti-rejection meds make him able to catch things easier. But our doctors and nurse practitioners at Lurie have always been like, you don't have to quit your job. It's going to be fine. (laughs) So I was able, I got, you know, six weeks of unpaid leave when I donated my kidney to him. Every boss I've ever had there has allowed me to adjust my hours as his medical care was more intense. Now it's much less intense. So I work a little more than usual. The only time that I have ever been affected was this March when COVID happened. I did move out into an apartment just because I didn't know what the implications would be for Max. And I didn't want to quit my job. I just thought that would be a really bad time to be kind of leaving the world when they needed me. My husband was lucky enough to work from home and stayed with my kids. And then I got an apartment and I was gone from March until June. Oh, I know that must have been very challenging. Nicole, how do you help families like Katie and Max in your role as a social worker? So I think I can speak to two ways I can support families. Previously in my role as medical social worker, working for the kidney disease and kidney transplant, um, as a social worker, we try to meet with families and talk with them about what's going on in their lives, about what barriers they have um, to coming to doctor's appointments, about what supports that social work can offer, what supports the hospital can offer. And a lot of times I found myself in the role as kind of a go-between between between the the medical team and families. And and what I mean is more so an advocate for for families with the medical team and with other organizations or other things such as schools. Social worker can help in advocating for a child and family's needs with school. Also, we can help with kind of like Katie was speaking to. So if there are any difficulties with talking with their jobs, um, with time off that's needed. Social worker can help advocate in that way. In my current role as as a therapist, um, I often see families who have a child with chronic illness, and that can range from kidney disease to cancer and, 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 you know, a lot of other different kinds of chronic illnesses. There's a lot of ways that we can support, but I think that Often what I'm doing is providing families with education around what happens when chronic illness impacts a family. So kind of normalizing that process, finding a way to help support their child, take medications, adhere to their diet. After their transplant, their diet changes so that they can eat a lot more typically or or have more ability to choose what they'd like to eat. But certain things like their sodium intake still needs to be really low and they have to drink a lot of water. That part I think can be really hard. Kids love chips. They love McDonald's. They love all the things that have super high sodium. And so one thing I think that's really important is just understanding how hard that is. And I also had one family that I worked with and they would have these water drinking competitions. So they would be like having water chugging competitions, which I thought was an awesome idea. Um, And so sometimes I'll kind of steal from other families too and, and share that with, with other families to help support them in in reaching these goals and, and adhering to their medical plan. That is such great information and support that you offer, Nicole. I am a kidney transplant recipient myself, and I struggle with getting in all the water that I need to. And while I was on dialysis, that diet was tough. So I really take my hat off to parents and to the children who live with this. It's not easy, and it is fairly Mm -hmm. invisible. So, Nicole, what are some of the biggest challenges of your job? either your current job or your previous job as a transplant social worker? One of the biggest challenges I would say is a lack of of resources to help support families. 
you know, I know Katie considers herself lucky in, in having work that was supportive of her, but, you know, I hear her resilience in that. I think that it's a lot as a caregiver to not only be the living kidney donor, but then caring for your, your child afterwards. And so many families have no child care support, especially with young ones, bringing them to medical appointments. I mean, after a kidney transplant, a child and, and their family have to come to the hospital a minimum of two times a week, even if they live in Chicago near the hospital, you know, but then thinking about families who live uh, out in the suburbs, Aurora, Joliet. So I would say that is one of the biggest barriers. I wish we had much more funding and things to be able to help families meet those needs. I think that's probably the what, what I notice as the, the biggest barrier of helping families. Those are real barriers and, and real issues that need to be addressed on a larger scale. What would you say, Nicole, are some of the rewards of your job? Oh, I, I feel like that's why I do this. That's why that's why social workers are social workers, is that because we see that a family does benefit from from our support and and that we can, you know, help families to succeed in some way. I was working with a family pretty closely post kidney transplant and I didn't make any magic happen for this family, Um, but I met with them every time they came in and I talked with them and, you know, maybe we colored together, maybe we played a game, maybe I called them on the phone to see how they were doing. I met up with them at other medical appointments when I could, when my schedule allowed for it. And this family was so grateful just for me being there. And a lot of times, um, you know, social workers say we, we kind of have a thankless role. And and I get that. I didn't get into this for, for the thank yous. But uh, I remember this caregiver wrote me a letter just saying how wonderful the support was that I provided the family. And that alone was so rewarding, just knowing that me being there, uh, trying to understand them, supporting them and, and having a voice for them when they needed that voice. That was like the biggest reward, to be honest, that I could have ever received. And those moments really make this work so valuable because Families don't have enough advocates. They don't have enough people saying this is really hard and recognizing that. And so I think that in itself is is why I keep doing what I do. Well, that was a great example. I'm glad you do what you do. Katie, what have been some of the challenges of caring for Max? I guess the main thing is the unpredictability. It was actually easier when he was like first diagnosed and he was a baby and he was just very sick then. Like he was on dialysis, he vomited every day. We knew he was sick. So you get into the practice of just kind of being on call all the time, like ready to go to the hospital, your bags are packed, you're ready to go. So then you learn that whole dialysis life and then you have the transplant and it's this whole new life to learn. They tell you it's not a cure, but in your mind, it's like, you think it's going to be a cure. <laughs> so yeah. and so we were very excited about the trans. Obviously, we were nervous too, but we we're very excited about it. And it, it mostly has been so much better than all of our eight months on dialysis. But it's also terrifying too. And I guess an example of it is when I moved back in June after, you know, self-quarantining myself from the family till we kind of figured out what COVID was and what all the precautions to follow and moving back. About a week and a half later, Max started vomiting and we have not, at this point, we have not been inpatient in the hospital for over a year, which is like a world record for us. And I'm like, oh my gosh, vomiting is the sign of COVID. I've been home for a week and I just gave my son COVID. So we gather up all the stuff because I still have that routine down. Like you pack everything up, you call the doctor before you go so you don't have to wait in the ER. And as we're driving there, 
he's still vomiting, but he's crying as we go over every bump. And this is where it comes in lucky being a nurse is that I'm like, oh my gosh, he has appendicitis. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> and all the doctors when we got to the ER thought I was crazy, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure he has appendicitis. <laughs> Because he cried when every bump we went over, like he finally stopped puking and fell asleep and he would still cry because I drive, usually drive pretty fast when I go down to the city and we had a lot of bumps to go over. But they did take me serious and he had a perforated appendix and had his appendix out that day and I've never been so happy for him to have surgery in his life. It's a challenge for sure. Yes, that sounds very yeah. challenging. How old is Max now? Um, He just turned 11 last week. What are some of the rewards of caring for Max? Oh, there's so many. He is his own reward because he's just so funny and so sweet. And But like if I ever ask him to share anything with me, like a piece of candy, he will say no. And my husband will always remind him like, do you? do you know what your mom did for you? <laughs> he, just, he, <laughs> anyway, but he makes up for it and being a little hilarious guy that, you know, makes me wish that I could donate an organ to every kiddo that needed it. So Katie, as an adult myself living with kidney disease and a transplant, I understand feeling different than others. And I can only imagine how Max must feel. How does your family address this and make life normal for him? You know, all of this happened before he was two years old. And do you remember anything that happened before you were two years old? So Not at all. <laughs> no. So this has been his whole life. So I think it's much harder for the kids or adolescents who ha it comes upon them later but for him, this has always been his life. We've never treated him any different than his sister, really. They both have to do the same things. There are a couple sports that he can't play, like contact sports. But other than that, he has been able to do anything that he's ever wanted to. And we don't really focus on what you can't do. Yeah, sounds like Max has a great normal life. He does. Nicole, what suggestions do you have for parents who are looking to empower and encourage their kids to be themselves, you know, to socialize with their peers and also help their friends understand their journey? Yeah, so I think what I would first suggest is encouraging kids to do the normal stuff that, yeah, there are certain restrictions like contact sports, but encourage them to, you know, and even have Zoom calls with friends encourage them to join clubs, to join activities and, and talk to their kids, you know, take time, sit down with them, make dinner without phones or requirement. And that is how kids then open up about what's going on with them when they see you as a support and, and yes, they're caregiver, but, but there's a little bit of friend in there too with caregiver and, and mom and dad. And so I think by creating that relationship is, is really important and also really recognizing all their strengths, you know, promoting that good self-esteem and seeing when they're doing things, when they're doing things well, recognizing that with them because they have other, many other barriers than kids that, that don't have kidney disease. And so, um, so I think it, that can be a really important part of the process. I also think that going to events with other kids that, that have chronic illness and have kidney disease or have transplant, getting to know uh, maybe a mentor that's had a transplant, I think that can really help to kind of normalize their experience and give them other ideas for how they can manage things, whether at school or at home. Those are great suggestions. Also, it can be difficult for children to understand and express their emotions, especially when they're not feeling well. What methods do you suggest that families use to deal with difficult emotions and behaviors? I mean, one big thing that I use all, like with all of my little clients that are struggling with managing big feelings is integrating some kind of relaxation or mindfulness into their daily lives. And that can look like anything from taking walks together to doing deep breathing, to doing yoga, 
to reading books, things that families find calming for them. I encourage them to create a practice around that and to also ask young people, ask children what they like to do to relax. I think taking some a break from screen time can be really helpful. I think it can be hard for a lot of kids, but um, encouraging a relaxation practice and really integrating that into their lives. And then I think if families are noticing that it's really hard to manage these big feelings and despite you know trying and working together, they still are struggling, then to look for help. Talk to your doctor, talk to your pediatrician, your social worker, um, reach out for uh, you know, a, a therapist to help or family therapy or even group therapy because you can't do this alone and you shouldn't have to. And so getting that extra support when you need it can, can really help families to cope with these tough times. That's really, really good advice. As a matter of fact, when we get done, I'm going to practice some mindfulness myself. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, so my last question is, I would like for each of you to share with me. Um, we'll start with Katie. How can friends and families best support um, others who have uh, kids with kidney disease or other chronic illnesses and their caregivers? Oh, we've, well, that's a really good question. I think just really being there for the family, um, we don't, you don't have to do anything really miraculous. Like you don't have to have like big fundraiser or anything like that. But I mean, the, the things that I remember when Max was really sick that people did like making a meal and dropping it off or calling or just even texting and saying that they're thinking about you and that, you know, you don't have to have any answers, just, you know, that there's, they're sorry that you're going through it, um, ha have been really meaningful and like continuing to be our friends, even though a lot of times we're limited on what we can do sometimes. Um, and the, the other thing that I think some people don't understand is like when you have a child that's, or anyone in your family that's Im immunocompromised, really being, um, you know, staying home if you're sick. I think that's a really important thing, even at holidays. Um, it's hard to, for people to wrap their mind around that. But like we've, when we've hosted holiday gatherings, I'm really forthright about saying, please don't come if you're sick or anyone, you know, you've, anyone in your family is sick. So, so those are, you know, just basic respect and, you know, that you're thinking about, you know, the, the family and, the um, person affected by kidney disease. That's great. Those those are good um, ways that people can help. Um, Nicole, what would you say? Well, I kind of want to um, just piggyback off of what Katie was saying. You know, in these times right now with with the COVID epidemic, um, you know, I often think about our kidney kids or any kids with chronic illness and. Um, and how, you know, people have mixed feelings about wearing masks or staying at home when you're sick. And, and I think so much about the families that are out there and, and, and just, you know, encouraging that behavior, hand washing, um, and, and all of those, uh, you know, preventative behaviors can be so helpful. Uh, and just to think about, think about others, you know, and how this could impact other people that you might not be worried about getting sick but there are a lot of other people who who could get really sick if they if they got um you know if they got this virus um and as far as helping others i think you know i i really like what katie said too not to steal all her answers but just kind of listening to people just being there and and not trying to find solutions um you know if that's what people are looking for you know, maybe offer that help. But a lot of times we just need a listening ear. We need somebody to be there for us and hold our hand or give us a hug or offer to bring dinner over. Um, sometimes those small things can go such a long way. And a lot of times we 
I think we want to help. And so we jump into solution focused mode or even telling people everything will be all right. Don't worry. And the thing is, you know, maybe things won't be all right and, and maybe they haven't been all right, but that by simply listening and supporting is so valuable. And so that's what I would encourage people to do. And and also volunteer, you know, if you if you have the time or the ability out there to volunteer at a hospital or um, volunteer for the National Kidney Foundation or, or any foundation for that matter, that can be also really valuable. And if you're interested in living, you know, living kidney donor or or any kind of other um, organ donation, I strongly encourage that as well, too, because there's so many people out there who need that support. Thank you so much, Katie and Nicole. This has been a fascinating conversation. You both are absolutely phenomenal women. And I really, I take my hat off to you both for all that you're doing in general, for what you've done in Max's life. He sounds like a fantastic guy. Um, Katie, you are his personal hero. And I hope one day he'll start to share his candy with you. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. I'll let you know if it happens. <laughs> okay, thank you, ladies, for taking this time to share your journey with me. Sure. Thanks, Monica. Thank you so much. There are about 10,000 children living with kidney failure in the United States. At National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, we offer fun educational programs and a summer camp experience for families like the Aducis. If you'd like more information on volunteering or supporting these programs, go to nkfi.org. At NKFI, prevention is a major part of our mission. That's why at the end of each episode, you will hear a nutrition tip. Here's Dr. Melissa Prest. Here's today's health tip about sleep. Getting good sleep quality is essential for your health and well-being. Adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep each night. Not getting enough sleep has been found to be associated with the development of chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and depression. You may not be getting good quality sleep if you wake up in the morning and do not feel rested, if you've repeatedly woken up during your sleep hours, or if you're experiencing symptoms of sleep disorders such as snoring or gasping for air. Improving sleep quality may be helped by better sleep habits or being diagnosed and treated for any sleep disorder you may have. Good sleep habits, sometimes referred to as sleep hygiene, should be done 30 to 60 minutes before your sleep time every day. Examples of habits that can be used to improve your sleep health include being consistent by going to bed at the same time each night and getting up at the same time each morning, including on the weekends. Engaging in some relaxing activities like taking a warm bath or shower, doing gentle stretches, meditating, focusing on your breathing, or spending some time reading a book that isn't on an electronic reading device. Make sure your bedroom is quiet, dark, relaxing, and at a comfortable temperature. Remove electronic devices such as televisions, computers, and smartphones from your bedroom. Avoid large meals, caffeine, and alcohol before bedtime. Get in some exercise during the day as this can help you fall asleep more easily at night. And limit napping during the day as this can disrupt your ability to fall asleep later. If you do need to nap, keep it to 30 minutes or less and avoid napping later in the afternoon. If you've implemented good sleep habits or you're still having difficulty with your sleep or the sleep difficulties continue to impact your day, talk with your healthcare provider for further care. With today's health tip, I'm Melissa Press, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. The Journey Continues is brought to you by the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois and sponsored by Donate Life Illinois. To learn more about kidney disease and living donation, visit www.nkfi.org. To register to become an eye, tissue, and organ donor, visit lifegoeson.com. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to and leave a review for The Journey Continues in Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. This podcast is produced by Rivet. 
To hear more great podcasts, visit rivet360.com.